for the first time ever, there is no crossover in our top 10 list showing how different our tasting games are becoming. But I don't think I'm going to see Maggie at Gen Con. <laughs> we'll be at opposite ends okay. of the con. Bye, Bye see you in a few days. See you never. <laughs>another top 10 list by Thinker Thema. I'm Amy, this is my wife Maggie. Hello. And we're not in our studio because we are traveling. We are on our way to Gen Con 2022, Exciting. which we are so excited about. And we're so excited about it that we've both been doing our independent research about which games we want to make sure that we can either check out and demo mm -hmm. at the con or have the opportunity opportunity to buy at the con. Um, I will say that this list that we've created, so we've created our top 10 each, mm -hmm. um, it doesn't include games that we've already played or we already own prototypes of mm -hmm. because this is genuinely the things that we're most excited to see. Yeah. So there are a lot of games like Septima, mm -hmm. um, trying to think of other games like Scout that we've been able yes. to play that I know a lot of people are excited about, um, mm -hmm. but we've already been, oh, um, the Guild of Merchant Explorers. Yes. So just yes, keep thinking of all that. these games yes. that are um, due for retail release that we've had the opportunity to play. So this is really mm -hmm. a list of our anticipated games uh, and some of them might be quite future facing. So you can think about this as broadly a list of things we're excited about that will probably come out in the next six months yeah. or so, um, and some of them available at Gen Con. So no, I'm gonna to stop talking. Exercise some patience, because they're not gonna be things that are gonna be immediately yeah. available. But yeah. we're also, what we're going to try to do, because we're doing research for ourselves for Gen Con, um, I'm of course looking up where, where can I find these games? Where can I check them out? Whether that's in the event halls or whether that's at a booth. Um, so we'll include that information down in the description below um, so that you can follow us around on our path through the <laughs> exhibition hall for the most part. Um, but anyway, let's get into our top 10. I have cheated a little bit. And of course, I had way too many for a top 10. Mm -hmm. um, so I actually unacceptable. have- Unacceptable. Unacceptable. I've got one additional game that I wanted to talk about called Garden Nation. And this was a game that was actually really quite hard to find information about. I believe it's being translated into English. I think it's going to be at Gen Con. I'm going to be on the lookout for it. Um, but this is a quite an interesting one. It will not appeal to Maggie uh, okay. because it is mostly uh, area control. Uh, where you're playing as one of four different clans and they have the seven different territories. And the cool thing about this game is it's all 3D. But the weird thing about this game is you're building, I believe it is coffee pots and to even check bird feeders. Okay. Coffee pots and bird feeders. I have no idea how that comes to life in this okay. game because you are in a garden. Okay. Mm -hmm. Don't know about the coffee pots. Mm. Interesting. Um, but what you're going to be doing is contributing to common buildings and earning victory points that way. But it caught my eye because it's meant to be highly interactive because, of course, you're competing for area control. But also your turn dictates where the next player has to place their pieces yeah. or where they can influence what's happening in that zone. So you also get to choose what, when you contribute to a common building or when you want to abandon being part of a common building. So that sounds really interesting to me. I don't know about dictating the next player's turn. That could either be an amazing design feature or it could be an epic disaster because I'm very prone to analysis paralysis and it means that you can't really decide what you're going to do until it gets to your turn. So I'm intrigued. It didn't make my yes. top 10, but I'm intrigued to check it out. That is my special number 11, Garden Nation. So my number 10 is going to be a game called Evergreen. Now, Evergreen, in Evergreen, you're trying to create the kind of greenest, most lush uh, planet. And so you're going to be doing that by planting seeds and growing trees. It's fairly abstract, which is probably why, not probably, definitely why it's so low on my list. But the reason it's on the list at all is because it does look pretty beautiful. So it's it's one of those, you're trying to you're trying to kind of uh, uh, plant your seeds and grow your, your trees in the most fertile areas. But at the same time, you don't want to overcrowd those areas because you're going to start kind of shading your, uh, your own trees. And one of the other things that you're trying to do is trying to be collecting or gaining the most light. 
I love the look of the double layer boards. I also love the look of the wooden meeples mm -hmm. and the cards. So it's got really, really beautiful artwork in the cards. So for that reason, it's my number 10. I am always excited to see what Horrible Guild bring out yes. because I think their production quality yeah. is always really nice. Um, I, I, the reason why it's not on my list is because I wasn't a fan of photosynthesis. Yeah. And when I read the you know the description of it, I was a bit worried that it was a little bit similar, but I'm also interested to check it out. So, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. My number 10 is a game called Sky Mines. And um, I know that a lot of people are anticipating this game because it is the reskin or re-theme of uh, the original game Mombasa by Alexander Pfister. Now, the original theme, incredibly problematic. It's the reason why we haven't played the game. And so I'm really excited that this is a new way to experience the mechanics of the game, which I've heard really great things about. Am I excited about mining the moon to earn <laughs> crypt coins? No. No, 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 no. No, in no way am I interested in the, the new theme. theme. Yes. Um, however, I am really interested in the mechanics. Um, it was hard for me to, to kind of work out how it plays. It is a fairly, it was a heavier style game. So I'm intrigued to see how everything comes together. My understanding is that you have a hand of cards and you're going to be simultaneously choosing what you want to play. Some of those cards are going to give you, in essence, resources that are going to help you buy new cards. Um, whereas other cards, uh, another action you can take, I believe, is to invest in the companies that um, are mining, in this case, um, the moon, uh, because you um, are trying to influence as well what those share prices are worth. So it's a bit of an economic game. Um, there's a bit of worker placement as well. All of these things that are, are combined with hand management are just mechanics that I absolutely adore. Um, so I really want to check that out. Um, that is my number 10, Sky Mines. My number nine is a game called Lacrimosa. I don't know if I'm putting the right emphasis on the right syllable there. But in this game, you are actually, you're kind of like a patron or sponsor of the, of the arts and you're helping complete uh, Mozart's last piece after his death. And so you're going to be working with his wife or widowed, and you're going to be working along a very Euro-y type um, game, uh, along two timelines. So one is sort of like the present where you're, you're helping kind of bring together the missing pieces for that, that final piece. And then the other timeline is sort of in the past where you're kind of, um, it's the thematic equivalent of you retelling or revisiting all the things that you did to help Mozart in his journey. So all of the, the uh, previous pieces that were, com um, that were composed and how you helped uh, expose or exhibit those or sell those. Mm -hmm. And so the whole idea is to, you know, it's not just uh, an altruistic, you know, wanting to, to get that final piece done. It's also, you want to make sure that your name is prevalent in the memoirs that get written about uh, you know, Mozart's uh, history. It's a little bit selfless then, there's, a little bit selfish. There's a little bit of, you know, you know, for the sake of the arts and also for the sake of, you know, enduring your own uh, legacy and reputation. So I'm intrigued by that one. Yeah. Now, this game is um, apparently not going, to, not going to be an open demo of it. There's just going to be a, a closed box and you get to kind of pick, pick, it, up, pick it up and see and how heavy it is. Check the weight of it, which I don't really know how, box. how valuable that is, but, I, you know, it is going to be there. And I think from all the little bits and pieces, I'm attracted to the theme, I'm attracted to the the, uh, to the what the mechanics are probably going to be like because it's also a deck builder. I kind of I, I buried the lead. I love deck building. So, and you love music trivia yeah, and music themes. I do. This is true. And biopics. Yes. Poor, poor Amy is always yeah. having to endure my, ooh, ooh, if there's a song in the room, it's like, did you know? I was like, I, I care not. And this was know. meant for a different singer. Yeah. yeah like, no. And these other artists no, recorded this? And then, yeah. yeah, all of that sort of stuff. <laughs> so, yeah, that's my number nine. I'm like intrigued to check seven. it out. I like to see new settings like mm. that for games. So, um, my uh, number nine is uh, Terracotta Army by Board and Dice. Now, this game is the next game in the T series line which we have a bit of a mixed relationship with, but they're always very well produced. Um, and, you know, Board and Dice have done a lot of work to make sure that this uh, game is culturally sensitive. They have cultural consultants in this game. And it's a setting that I really enjoy because I have been to see the Terracotta Warriors uh, twice, actually, once with my mom when we traveled around China. And then recently when I took Maggie to go yeah. and look at it as well, because it is just absolutely, it is, you cannot even fathom yeah. how incredible the scale is it's because it's just airport hangars 
filled with these terror, this terracotta army um, of all these massive, mm. massive uh, clay um, warriors and yeah, soldiers. Warriors. Yeah, no horses. It's just amazing. Yeah. Um, so anyway, back to the game. The game uh, mechanically is quite interesting because what you're going to be doing is you're going to be aligning three discs. There's an action selection wheel. And on your turn, you're going to be able to turn that wheel. One wheel only moves counterclockwise and another moves clockwise, which seems like a bit of a crazy spatial puzzle <laughs> for me. Um, and then you're going to be able to take all three actions that are in line with each other. I'm intrigued by that. I'm also concerned about that because of my analysis paralysis. And I think that will like, oh, so many possible combinations could be bad. But what you're going to be doing in this game is ultimately trying to collect clay um, to use as the main resource to then build out the miniatures in this game, which are the different parts of the army, to put them in the mausoleum. Mausoleum? which is the burial chamber, essentially, which is a grid on the board. And what you're going to be trying to do is put um, the exact same type um, of uh, army, me know, army like member, soldier, warrior, soldier, warrior, warrior um, together uh, to get as, as many victory points as possible. I really like the idea of the clay. The clay is when it's wet, you can use it, and then it can dry as well, and then you can't use it to build just like in real life. Yeah. Um, so there are some intriguing elements here. It's hard to know how they will all come together, but I really would like to check it out. I believe this game is going for sale um, and will probably be selling like hotcakes at Gen Con. Uh, so that is my number nine, Terracotta Army. My number eight is a game called Dulce. Now, Dulce is sweet in Spanish, and it's also, the game is about sweets. It's about making sweets. I actually really like this one, even though it seems like it's a, it's a fairly uh, straightforward uh, little card game, because you've got uh, a hand of cards, and I believe everyone has the same um, deck or hand of cards, and they on the one side they have things like um, coffee beans and uh, cacao, which is where chocolate comes from, or vanilla, so it's sort of like ingredients on the one side. And then on the other side, they've got factories or the, the ways of creating the sweets once you have the resources. So I believe kind of bingo style, what you're going to be doing is one player is going to call out which card is going to be active. And then every other player gets to play that card at the same time, but you get to decide which side you're going to play it as. So that's the ingredient side or as the kind of manufacturing side. So I really love games where you all kind of start with a, an even playing field and then you're, you're kind of getting to optimize. And, and obviously everyone's going to end up with a completely different setup uh, because then based on you know whatever resources you've decided to do, or then it's going to determine what you're going to be able to make. And so again, it sounds fairly simple. It sounds fairly easy to teach and easy to pick up. And um, I wasn't able to get much of a, um, a view of what the cards themselves are going to look like, because that's probably going to be the main determinant. If, if that's all you're really using, mm -hmm. um, the aesthetic of that is going to be a big kind of draw, draw card, so to, so to speak, uh, for it. But I'm intrigued by that one. So that's my number eight, uh, Dulce. Nice. My number eight is Great Western Trail Argentina. Mm. Now, this is a game that will not be available at Gen Con, um, except for in demo form. And I am just super intrigued to see what it looks like, what this new um, series of Great Western Trail is going to bring in terms of changes to the main game. We absolutely adore Great Western Trail. I just noticed it's the second Alexander Fister game that I'm talking about on this list. Um, but this game, if you haven't played the original game, uh, amazing kind of uh, hand management, deck building, rondel game um, that is set where you're trying to deliver cattle to different cities. Um, now there's this new series, Great Western Trail Argentina is the first one, which is a slight variant on the original game. It brings in a couple of new things. Um, there's a new worker type called Farmers. There's also a new resource um, of grain, which you can use and spend um, in different locations on the board. Um, but I think what intrigues me the most is there are more opportunities to shortcut cut the rondelle and I love games where you can go slowly and get lots of things done which Maggie tends to like mm. she's a builder she likes to yeah. really nurture yeah. her you know put lots of buildings in place and win that way whereas I love to race I just want to get through and try and try to efficiently get as much done as, as possible and then ultimately end the game as quickly as possible in a lot of games just because it annoys Maggie so much. I well. never win. You said win that. 
that way. I never win that way. I play that way, but you always win with your racing. <laughs> but I just thought it was intriguing because in Great Western Trail, there are a lot of buildings that give you a lot of actions and bonuses along the way. So if you're shortcutting the board, mm, it yeah. might not be worthwhile, but then you get to deliver more cattle more of the time. So I'm intrigued to see how that plays out in the game. Um, so I'm going to check out the demo of that. However, I also wanted to note that um, they are also releasing the second edition of uh, Rails to the North, which is the original expansion uh, for Great Western Trail that we did own. We actually got rid of our um, first edition of Great Western Trail to pick up the new one uh, because of the slight retheming around um, Native Americans uh, were actually taken out of the second one because it was a little bit problematic how they were being treated in the game. Um, so that's changed in the second edition, but they have only just now released the expansion that's compatible with that second edition. So it's got the double layered boards, but it also introduces a new breed of cow. Mm. So. Uh, Intrigued to check that out. Mm. I don't know what the new cow brings. Yeah, um, but that is my number eight, Great Western Trail, Argentina, and Rails to the North. My number seven is a game called Village Rails, which is by Osprey Games, who also uh, publish Village Green, which we really loved. Which yeah. that you kind of little... Uh, that was a real surprise. It really was, yeah. 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 Like a little tableau bit. There's fireworks in the background, so you'll hear some. Yeah, um, because, you know, middle of the day, <laughs> why not? <laughs> um, so Village Rails, it's sort of a, a successor, but it's a completely different design team now, even though it's the same publisher. Uh, same artist, so the artwork is by the same artist, um, but in Village Rails, you're going to be building a tableau, um, so similar to Village Green, and in this one, you're actually connecting different uh, villages in England through rail, meeting some very specific uh, needs that the locals have. So I enjoyed that. Uh, you brought out... Oh, you, so good. You, the you tag love line. The, yeah, you love the tagline. Yeah, I loved that tagline as well. Just like local... What is it? Locomotives. Locomotives. And local motives. Motives. Yeah, because you, so you're good. meeting the goals of the locals. So That's very nice. straightforward. Uh, yeah, card um, sort of card game tableau building. I think it's going to be fun. Great design team as well, because it's uh, Matthew Dunstan, who we've loved Matthew's design uh, recently. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah... So I'm looking forward to that. I'm also looking forward to that. I did make my top 10, but I'm excited to check it out. Um, but my number seven, is that where we're at? Yes, that my is My number we're seven at. is yes. Andromeda's Edge. Now, I find it really hard to say Andromeda. Is it Andromeda? I think it's Andromeda. I think it's Andromeda. Andromeda's, Andromeda's Edge. Yeah, that sounds better. Andromeda's Edge is the much anticipated follow up game to Dwellings of Eldervale Elder by Luke Laurie. Um, of course, completely different world. This one is set in space, um, but it has um, a similar kind of style of blended um, Euro and battle mechanics um, where it's area control, um, a bit of worker placement, um, and also, of course, battling using dice. And we, for the longest time, stayed away from Dwellings of Eldervale because it looked too far in the dice in chucker the fantasy, kind of fantasy yeah. space. And we're like, no, that's not for us. But we played it. You can see our review. We absolutely adored Loved it. it. Yeah. It's very Euro-S. So I'm super excited to see what Luke Laurie is doing with this follow-up game. It's being published by Cardboard Alchemy, who are the publishers um, of Flamecraft. And Peter Vaughan, who heads up the company, was heavily involved in Dwellings and um, the high production quality. So I'm actually really excited to see, because Flamecraft is so beautiful as it well. It really was, yeah. Um, and, an, and an amazing campaign. So I'm really interested to see what they're going to throw in there when the, cam the campaign launches, um, hopefully fairly soon. But at Gen Con, they are demoing the game. They don't have a booth, um, but I'll put the information below about where to find them in one of the halls so you can see um, the prototype of the game and get a, f a sense for what it's all about. And Luke Laurie's going to be there too, so if you want to awesome. meet him, that's pretty exciting. Um, but yeah, I'm really intrigued to play this one. I just um, yeah. apparently... Um, Luca said that it's going to be slightly heavier than Dwellings oh, of Eldervale. Okay. And so I'm into that. Yeah, yeah I'm into a that. Bit heavier I could, could I be do good. a bit heavier. Yeah. I'm not crazy about uh, the theme. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like the setting, I should say. It's like, oh, mm. like, and that's just because it's, you know, more space. space. Yeah. More space. Yeah. But we're looking forward to checking that out. Yeah. Um, so that is Andromeda's Edge. My number six is a game called Tenpenny Parks, which is about theme parks. And so in this game, we're going to be trying to get the most VP, also known as 
Victory point. No, incorrect. Visiting people. <laughs> I like that they did that. They got their VP, but they actually make it visiting people. That was like a trap. It was. It was a trap, and you fell right for it. Um, so, so in this one, I, I enjoy that you've got this sort of central uh, kind of carousel style a place that that is going to determine. And well, it's two things. One is sort of like your worker placement spots, but it's also going to have the market of what are the different types of attractions that you're going to be able to to build or to, to kind of gain, purchase and build on your little polyomino uh, board, where you also are going to have inconveniently uh, build, um, uh, trees that you're going to have to maneuver around or get rid of in order to like build your, your attraction. So I, yeah, I like the combination of all those different things. Ultimately, you're going to be getting points. Uh, by both the types of attractions that you build because of you know the people that visitors that visiting people that you're mm-hmm. attracting but also there's going to be these three different tracks of joy thrill and awe mm-hmm. so depending on the ride you're going to be leave, like bringing up your your stats on those three so it looks fairly uh fairly fun straightforward and yeah i enjoy the theme so i'm excited to check it out yeah. it looks a little light when i was looking yeah. at it but i'm really intrigued to try it and see what we think because sometimes we just really enjoy light games so. correct yes uh, yes they're easy to bring other people on yeah. board as well like especially polyometer Tiles. Yeah, everyone can kind of yeah. understand that concept because you know everyone's played Tetris or something like that yes. at some point. Yeah, yeah. So my number six is a game called Sink or Swim. Now, if you watch back chat, you'll know that this is a game that for some reason I was very drawn to, and actually. At Dice Tower West, when we went there, they had a huge poster for it, and I was just like, where is this Where is this game? But I could only find it in poster form. Um, and apparently at Gen Con, it will be available to purchase, so I'm excited to go and check that out. It is a game about synchronized swimming, which is a theme that you don't see very often, yeah. um, but I'm super intrigued by it. It is also cooperative, which is not what we usually do, but it's a real-time experience. And... I am really always fascinated by real-time games. Um, Sometimes they're a real hit for us, other times not. But this one seems like one of those light um, party-style games that I could... Yeah, fun game that I could take to the office Mm -hmm. and get people really involved in because it's all about communicating with each other because you're trying to pull off a synchronized swimming routine, um, but you're going to be doing that by trading cards. So it reminds me a little bit of um, what we call Billionaire here, which was Uh, the the game we played Um, a lot, the Dice Tower West. With the bell. Yeah, so it's a, oh yeah, I can't remember the name. So is it a uh, bull market or something like that? No, I think someone is going to correct us in the comments. Yeah. The bell game. Yeah. The Joey fan <laughs> will know the bell game. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. But it's, um, you're it's going to chaos. It's it like is fun chaos. chaos. But you're yeah. trading cards. And so that's similar to what you're doing here. Um, and there is a dedicated free app at the center of this game, which is going to be. Um, Kind of judging you on how on your time that it takes to finish and pull off this routine um, as well as your accuracy and i believe there's also some things that get in your way as you go that are going to you know increase the complexity of the routines um, as you go up levels so i don't know it just sounds like a really fun time and so i want to check that out that is my number six sink or swim my number five is a game called Kites, which I sort of got to demo. We sort of we got did. to demo. We got a bit of a demo. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I haven't fully played like a full game of it. Now, Kites is has got beautiful art by Beth Sobel, and it's a real time game where you're trying to keep cooperative. It's a co op as well. I should I should mention that <laughs> real time and co op. I think we seem to be fine with co op if they're real time. Yeah, because that it adds, adds like stress, the tension. Yeah, and then the same. It replaces the competitive yeah, tension yeah. with really. Stress stressful time-based yeah. tension. So. so anyways, so in this game, you're trying to keep your kites. You have multiple kites of different colors and you're trying to keep them flying. And the way you do that is you've got these sand timers that are, you know, they sort of get started as soon as that flight, it, that kite is flying. And then you, you, you're kind of collectively keeping an eye on the sand timers and making sure that you play the kite of that color um, as it's about to run out so that you can kind of flip it over and and buy yourself more time Mm -hmm. and the whole aim of the game is to try and get through this whole deck of uh, kite cards Um, but if you do manage to like if you unfortunately let any of them uh, crash then you get these sort of penalty cards that make the game trickier Mm -hmm. so it's it's a very simple uh, com- uh, concept, but I remember even just from the quick demo, I was like, this is actually quite intriguing and could be quite a fun uh, experience. So that's why it's my number five cuts. 
My number five is also a real time game experience. Lots of real time happening at the moment. Yeah. Um, with beautiful art by another one of our favorite um, graphic designers and artists, Ian O'Toole. Yes. Um, and that game is Fit to Print. Mm. And Fit to Print is um, coming out from Flat Out Games. Uh, who also love that publishing team. Yes. And this game you're going to be playing as animals who are, are responsible for uh, printing a newspaper of yes, all things. And, yeah. and you're going to want to create um, a headline or front page story. And the way you're going to be doing that is by what I understand, because this is a very early kind of information release, is you're going to be drafting tiles that you're going to be doing in real time around other people, so components of a newspaper article. And when you think you've got all the tiles that you need, you're going to yell the word layout and then move into this next phase where you're going to be spatially arranging those tiles in order to create um, your front page. And when it's ready to go, you yell print, and then you're able to select from a number of bonuses or things for being the first person to do that, um, etc. And so it just sounds like it's beautiful. The art is so cute. I really enjoyed the theme of it being a newspaper. I think it'll be another one of those on the lighter style games that we can get to the table more often with friends, you know, as a, you know, with our friends who are not as into board games or at work, that type of yeah. environment. More casual um, environments. Yes. So I believe they're demoing the game. Um, it's, I don't think it's anywhere near release yet, um, but that is uh, fit to print. My number four is a game called Nightfall, and knight is in like a knight in shining armor. Uh, and this game, the, if I'm honest, the only reason it's in a number four, it's not for the theme, uh, it's just entirely because of Ryan Lockett uh, is a co-designer and co-artist uh, in, in the creation of it. And I have been really sort of uh, excited and enjoying my venture into Ryan Lockett uh, created worlds. Mm -hmm. So in this game you are playing, it's actually a team-based game. So you, you, you play as teams of either knights or demons. And so you're, if you're the knights, you're trying to protect these elders that obviously have, you know, this incredible uh, knowledge or, you know, they're keeping something sacred and then you've got the demons coming to try and destroy the elders to, you know, get through, as demons do. I, I, you know, I don't, again, fantasy themes, I'm kind of like, mm -hmm, yeah, <laughs> okay. Um, I'm also not super into that kind of teams of like, you know, the versus. Mm -hmm. However, the only reason it's sort of here is because there is a campaign mode where you actually can just play as the knight and there's a story mode where you get to kind of explore this whole, you know, going to go on a journey and an adventure and then uh, eventually fighting off the kind of final uh, final battle sort of thing. And so I'm, that's, that's the main thing that's keeping me kind of going, hmm, tell me more because I do enjoy the sort of narrative uh, heavy uh, driven games that Ryan Lockett has mm. been a part of. And that's the reason why I haven't really gotten into any Red Raven games is they are such story narrative heavy mm. style games. Maggie tends to play them solo. Yeah. Um, I try to dabble and then quickly move on and um, mm. get a little yeah. bit bored. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> get a little bit bored only because I'm just so like, how do I win? But it's usually cooperative. But this one, competitive. Yeah, so yeah if you do the team base. If you do the team yeah. base, maybe this will be my entry point. Yeah, except I'm like less into the uh, team base. It, yeah, so you'll just be like, no, I'm playing like, solo. No, I'm yeah. doing my campaign going. <laughs> yeah, okay. the campaign That's is fine. one to two, one to two players, but yeah, then it's co-op and you'll be like, I'm out. Yeah. So, oh, no. Yeah. yeah. So I'm, I'm keen to check it out and kind of get get more information. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and get, get more of a feel for it. Mm -hmm. My number four is a, well, completely at the other end of the spectrum, it's Twilight Inscription. Now, we have not played Twilight Imperium, no. the, any edition, um, it, which is a huge, sprawling, forex space game um, that can take a long time to play. I've, it's, I don't think it's uncommon to have a game that lasts like nine or ten hours. Big um, commitment. Yeah. An investment of time. A huge and investment of time. And because it's space thing. <laughs> Uh, like it's just such a huge investment of time to be like, well, yeah, I didn't enjoy it. Um, there are some people <laughs> for me. There are some people. A day later. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. There are some people that we know, um, Rel, looking at you, who absolutely adore this game, which is a reason why it has been on my radar. And maybe one day I'll sit down and have someone teach it to us. Um, but Twilight Inscription is actually the roll and write version of this epic game. 
And I'm intrigued by that because it looks like an epic roll and write because instead of having a single player sheet that you're drawing on, you have four um, to choose from. And what's really interesting about the way that this game works or what I, how I think it works is that each round starts with an event. And I love an Do event. Love events. I really love an event. Um, but what you're also doing in this game is each turn you are having to decide which board you are going to apply the resources or the dice roll or whatever it is to. So you're only able to take one action on one of the boards, which means that you can kind of specialize and get better in one of those areas of one of your four boards. But the events make it such that something unexpected could happen. And if you've underdeveloped one of your boards, then you're going to be in big trouble. Mm -hmm. And I really just like that tension of Oh, it's get you know, because I've invested so much over here, it's starting to get really good. Do I keep like pushing my luck yeah. and, and, and building that out? Or do I like try and have a balance like just in case yeah, just in case something happens? Mm. Um, and I think that the things that can happen involve like interaction between other players in terms of who's built up things the most and that type of thing. I don't really know don't know because I haven't played the original game. But I'm super intrigued by this. It is not launching at Gen Con officially, um, but it is being demoed. I think the demos are all booked out, but we'll be wandering through to try and get a look at this game um, and see, yeah. you know, kind of how it plays. So I'm intrigued by that. That is my number four, Twilight Inscription. And my number three is Clan Catacombs, which I have not yet. We have not played any. We haven't Clank. played any Clank. We games. have all these dates uh, with friends to play Clank, and we even had like this sort of Clank Legacy uh, gaming group lined up, and then the pandemic happened, mm -hmm. and then the gaming never happened. So I'm, I and I love deck builders, so I'm really excited to check out Clanks at some point. So this is, you know, my this my. It's well, maybe the uh, entries. It's a standalone game, and it's really you're looking into going to the catacombs of this dragon. And as you're kind of going through it, you're you're it's actually tile uh, tile laying. So you're going to be uh, exploring or 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 um, creating or sort of unveiling the the layout of the dungeon as you go. And every dungeon will be different because of that tile laying nature. And as you go through it, you're going to be like rescuing prisoners, getting some loot, and then making sure that you get out. Uh, before the dragon kind of mm. gets you, I'm intrigued just because I'm yeah, like I, I love the deck building. Series. Yeah, yeah, the time series. I not like people rave about it. Mm. So yeah, and so it's it different to the original plank, which has a fixed board, right? Mm. And so in this version, you are revealing the dungeon as you yeah. go, Correct. or the catacombs as yeah. you go, um, and discovering things to I assume fight. Yeah, so there's going to be obviously foes <laughs> that you're going to be fighting along the yeah. way, like different like little. Things that, yeah, prisoners for getting free, mm -hmm. I'm imagining, like, loot and things you're going to mm -hmm. be gaining. So, yeah, hmm. all, all the kind of fun uh, little things. Like, hmm. yeah, more, I'm more intrigued about the deck building side of it and seeing, like, how that plays out. Hmm. Yeah, I forgot what my number three is. My number three <laughs> is um, a very much anticipated uh, expansion for a game that I absolutely adore, and that is Meadow Downstream. So Meadow is a game that came out last year, and it was one of my favorite games of 2021. Um, and basically in that game, you are um, collecting fauna and flora from this beautiful meadow habitat uh, with, I think the, art, the artist, her name is uh, Carolina Kijak. She's also done the art for, this like watercolored art for mm. downstream as well. Um, and what you're doing in the game is you are drafting cards in this quadropolis style grid. Uh, but then the main part of the game is how you manage the cards in your hand because certain cards have requirements to build. Um, so you want to make sure that you optimize your hand and card placement and tableau building by playing things in the right order. And that is something that I really love in games is gaming out the structure to my next series of turns. Mm -hmm. I really, really enjoy that. And I, I feel like that is a strength of mine is that that forward planning. I tend to do well in those style really of games, do, yeah. which makes me feel better towards yeah, those yeah. kinds of games. Um, but in um, Downstream, it's going to be a new habitat, essentially, that is being created um, with these rivers. There's a new kayak mechanic, which mm -hmm. I'm interested to check out, but it introduces all this new fauna and flora from um, the, the water, um, which is exciting. And also, apparently, the riverboard can be flipped 
so that you can control the level of competitiveness of the game. Oh, and you'll know which side <laughs> we'll be using like the more most competitive, competitive yeah. side. Like making enemies uh, <laughs> setting. Yes, yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> no longer talking, sleeping in different <laughs> rooms setting, please. Um, so that will this game will be available, this expansion will be available to purchase at Gen Con, so I'm going to snap up a copy if I can. That is my number three, Meadow Downstream. And now the game number two for me is going to be First in Flight, which we actually covered as part of Backchat. And this is about the, uh, the early days of flying machines, or when we were trying to uh, develop the airplane uh, technology. And so it's really a race to be the first in flight, the first to get a particular distance in your, with your flying machine. Mm -hmm. Another deck building game. Again, I haven't played this game, but from what I could see from the campaign and all of that information, it, it looks quite thematic. Like the theme mm -hmm. is quite well integrated because you know the whole deck building thing is you, you've got this rondelle, which is what it's allowing you to go into all these different positions and either um, uh, like add things, add technologies or do kind of uh, research and add technologies into your flying machine to hopefully mean that you can go longer distances, but it also going to be in like building in some uh, malfunctions or design uh, faults or issues or errors um, and then you're also going to have all the placements where you you know you either can get money to purchase some of those cards get um, uh, recruit or get assistance and then or also take flight like try your machine out and so quite keen because then you know that yeah, I just love how it seems really straightforward, but then this whole thing of okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna try my machine out, and it's only when you're trying it out that you get to see what some of the design errors are, what the, some of the faults, and they out they affect obviously the, the distance. yeah, and mechanically yeah. it's push your luck. So you're yeah, trying exactly. to go oh, like, as going, far as you can. Like mm -hmm. oh, I came across a, a design fault, um, which then you know that once you know what they are you can then uh, fix them so that's one of the other actions that you can do later on in your turn is address those fix those which then make sure that well now we know what the error was or now we can kind of have a longer flight mm -hmm. so i i enjoy that so I'm, I'm keen to check that one out yeah there's one that we didn't back i think because we haven't been backing as much lately because of the expensive shipping cost to yeah. australia but since we're here yeah. since we're gen con Go and check it out. I don't believe it's available for sale yet. I could mm -hmm. be wrong, but we'll note all that in the description below. Um, but yeah, I'm intrigued to check that one out yeah. as well. My number two is an interesting game that only came onto my radar as I started to hear about games at Gen Con. And this is a little game called Boop. And <laughs> this game, they said it is a worthy follow-up to Shobu. And if you aren't familiar with Shobu, it's a two-player only abstract game that is absolutely beautiful in its um, production execution because it features rocks and a rope and two wooden boards where you are essentially trying to mirror actions and a win against your opponent. In this game, Boop, they have made it, uh, it's a different designer, um, and the theme is cats and kittens mm -hmm. and super adorable little cat meeples that you're going to be playing with. But the idea of this game is that you're attempting to get three cats in a row. That's how you win the game. But in order to get a cat, you need to have three kittens in a row. Mm -hmm. So you start by placing out kittens. But what's interesting and why the game is called Boop is that whenever you put a new cat or kitten out onto the board, it pushes out every other cat and kitten <laughs> and kitten by one space. So everything surrounding it, even diagonally, just goes whoo. And that's so the whack. that's the yeah, that's the <laughs> boop action. Okay. It's like boop, I've pushed you out. I thought boop, because it's like boop like and, and I don't know if maybe this is a boop with dogs. Boop is when you like hit them on the nose and you touch them on the nose and go boop. I think it's booping each other out, but the same yeah. kind of like boop noise. I like the boop. <laughs> So you also um, you can fall off the board as well. So it could be a boop and they fall off the board. And <laughs> so um, you can you think about how this plays out in an abstract game is that it's going to be really difficult to align three kittens or three cats because the whole board state is constantly moving and you really need to have a good grasp of spatial awareness to know where all those cats are going to try and boop them in the right direction to create a connection of three cats mm. or three kittens. Yeah. Um, so I'm really intrigued by this game. It is available for sale at Gen Con and I will certainly be picking up a copy. That is my number two boop. 
And my number one is a game called Maple Valley, which is a, a sequel to Creature Comforts, which I really loved because it was just, it's just a perfect theme. I just absolutely love that theme. So in Maple Valley, we have survived the winter in comfort because, you know, that was the whole thing that we did with Creature Comforts was make sure that we decked out our house to have the coziest of, uh, of winters. And now uh, spring has sprung and it's going to be the spring jamboree uh, event where everyone comes out of their homes and now gets to gather around with the, uh, with the local uh, town folk and celebrate and, you know, come catch up with friends and celebrate all of that sort of stuff. Now, we are going to be playing as the uh, kind of like the kids um, who will be scrambling off into the into the woods to look for uh, for things to help with the jamboree. So to help a lot of the help the grown ups with some of the tasks. And but because it's sort of we're coming out of um, out of winter, or at least this is what I'm imagining, the, the tracks are not as well, uh, they're not as clear. So we're going to have to, you know, sort of swim and, and dig our way through to get to the places we can forage and get all of those resources. Now, I don't know a lot about how the game is going to play out, but I really love uh, Creature Comforts. And, you know, it's a game that, you know, you can play solo. It's, it's the same with, um, with, with this one. And so I'm quite keen to Check it out. The artwork looks just as beautiful as and inviting um, as Creature Comforts. And it's only available as a, a fairly early demo, I mm. believe, at Gen yeah. Con. But yeah, yeah. it's exciting to see that come yeah. to life. Yeah. So yeah, keen to get, you know, jump back into that, that world. Yeah. yeah, and my number one is a game called Cat in the Box. And this is a trick-taking game that is available to purchase from Bezier Games. It's the second Bezier Games on this list. They are not a sponsor of this video, no. um, but I will be at their booth purchasing these games. Um, you will be sponsoring them. <laughs> I will be. Um, Cat in the Box is a trick-taking game, as I mentioned, but the interesting thing about this game is that your cards have no suits. Mm -hmm. So you only have cards that um, are black and they are numbered, I believe, one to nine. Um, and obviously you are going to have a random collection of numbers and what you're trying to do is predict the number of tricks that you're going to win um, using a little player board thing that you have to indicate whether you're going to commit to winning three tricks or just one trick or maybe four tricks. And once you've done that, you're going to be playing, the first player of course is going to play a lead suit, but in this game, that you're going to be playing obviously just a numbered card and then assigning it to one of four suits around your player board. So for example, um, you might say, well, I've got a three, I'm gonna allocate that to blue. Now it's a three blue. And what's interesting about this game is once you've done that, you take it, one of your player tokens and you put it on this scoreboard that shows that you've now blocked three blue. And for the rest of this round, there will be no one, uh, for the rest of this game, I should say, there will be no one accessing blue three. That is done. And so someone else might, Maggie might want to win the trick and play like a stronger six um, or whatever the case may be in blue to win the trick, but then that has been taken and can only be used once. Now, when this game becomes really interesting is because you're blocking out numbers and suits, Ultimately, in this game, you start to run out of options. So you want to play something because you've only got a certain number, but that card has been taken, so you've got no choice but to lose the suit or uh, to lose the round, the trick. The trick yeah. um, and so that's really interesting to me. There's also like a little scoring dynamic that on the scoring board, you're placing out your player tokens, but at the end of the game, if you manage to actually... Uh, get the number of tricks that you predicted at the start, you're going to be able to score based on the adjacencies of your tokens on that board. So there's just so much to think about in this game. Um, it, it seems really complex. There are a couple of other rules as well that make it even harder. For example, if you can't follow suit and you have to play a different suit, you will lose the ability to use that other suit for the rest wow. of the round. So it's just, really punishing. no, it gets blocked mm. and you can no longer use that suit. So it's sounds an, stressful. It sounds stressful. <laughs> it looks like an incredibly um, kind of thinky, trick-taking game, which they're usually pretty thinky, but this one seems like it's like next level thinky. Um, if you're interested in this game, 
highly recommend the playthrough or the teach um, by Before You Play, Monique and Naveen. I'll link to that below because it really, I had heard of the game and I was like, I'm not sure. And then I watched this and I was like, that's the game I need to buy at Gen <laughs> Con. Um, so thank you for that incredible teach, Monique and Naveen. Um, and have a, look at, have a look for that game at Bezier Games. Um, but that is our top 10, which is actually a top 20 yeah. because we our tastes have diverged a lot. Yeah. We both started in more traditional Euro territory. Mm -hmm. I think I've stayed more in my lane in, in that yeah. regard. Maggie's moving more into more immersive thematic yeah, it's, I think it's, it's sort of at the moment it seems to be very uh, aesthetics uh, driven mm. and kind of like, is that a world that's kind of interesting? And then does it have, you know, a little bit of, you know, a couple of mechanics I'm think, that I feel I'm going to enjoy, but largely it's an aesthetic and setting. Yeah, yeah and mine is still very much about, oh, that, that mechanic seems intriguing mm. oh, and I still love my abstract games. Um, but yeah, please tell us below, what are you looking for at Gen Con? Is there anything that we didn't mention that is on your list? Uh, what are you most excited about? Uh, if you see us around, walking around, trying to find these 20 things, <laughs> you'll probably be able to find us. We're either going to be trying to find these 20 things or I'm going to be in the consignment room buying a whole heap of secondhand games. So I have no idea how all of this is going to fit into our suitcases. Um, but come by and say hi. We would love to meet you and hope you all have a safe and wonderful trip to Gen Con. And we'll be back with more board game content soon. But otherwise, bye for now. Bye.